Bro. Folks got a kick out of that this morning. There's the mic. Hello, earth. <laughs> Romans 6, if you want to open there with us uh, again tonight, we'll read the four verses we used this morning. Uh, we'll finish up in verse 3 and verse 4. Romans chapter 6, you found it, say amen. If you're happy you found it, say amen. I'm happy you found it too. Romans 6 verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Father, bless this word tonight. Let it minister to our hearts and accomplish what you would have for it to accomplish. I pray if there's one in here tonight who's never been saved, that they'd be saved in this service. Your will be done in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, the Tim McGraw thing, I know we've got some here tonight that weren't here this morning. Tim McGraw writes the song and sings the song and it comes out and it's a big hit about uh, uh, going skydiving and mountain climbing and 2.7 seconds on a bull named Fu Manchu. And he said he hoped that people, if they ever had the chance, would get to live like they were dying. And so we took that and even went a little further because I'm not as nice as Tim McGraw. I'm a little bit better looking, but not as nice. Thank you. <laughs> I'd have stopped right there till y'all got that one. And we said this morning that we need to live like we were dead. <laughs> that we need to live like dead people. Because this is what the Bible calls us to be. It's to be dead to sin, dead to ourselves, dead to the old man, dead to the old ways and that old nature, and alive in Christ, a new creation. And that's what Paul is dealing here in Romans 5 he comes through the whole thing, and it keys on Romans 5 and verse 20. And the argument in verse six, or chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, is a response to what I believe he thinks they felt about verse 20, which is where he says in Romans 5, 20, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And what he, what he leads up to that with is that by Adam, sin came upon all men. But there was not really a, a, a judge or a rule book for sin until Moses and the law. But he said, still, death reigned from Adam until Moses. And then when the law came, then there was a standard that proved everything that we knew about sin, taught us what we know about sin. And that is that sin brings death. Sin brings death to a marriage. Sin brings death to a friendship. Sin brings death to a church. And sin will bring death to a ministry. But what you find is is there's grace that abounds where there's sin, and so then there's an answer. There's a remedy. We talked a little bit this morning about how just because there's a remedy doesn't mean you ought to go try to get something. Just because there's a flu shot doesn't mean you ought to go try to get the flu, right? Just because there's an answer. Just because there's a hospital don't mean you ought to go out there and act crazy and end up there. And so what Paul's driving home is just because there's grace doesn't mean there ought to be sin. Doesn't mean that we ought to live in open sin and free sin and just do things as we feel in our heart like we ought to do, but we still ought to go back to the Word of God. And even though there's grace to compensate for our insufficiencies and to keep us out of trouble when we do sin, the fact of the matter is, is that grace is not a permission slip. And so that's what Paul drives, and we talked about how to live like we were dead. <laughs> how do we live like we're dead as a child of God? Well, we said first of all this morning, you live like you're dead by acknowledging your passing. Kind of like a funeral. We have to come to grips with the fact that we're dead and we're a part of Jesus Christ. That we're dead to sin. That when I got saved, I didn't just buy a, a, a get out of hell free card and get to go to heaven one day. When I got saved, I became a child of God, a representative of heaven. And he's called me now to be a picture of his love, a picture of his grace. And people ought to see in me everything that they see in Jesus, or at least in part. They ought to see in me Jesus Christ. If I have a relationship with somebody, I'll give you an example of this, and this is by no means to, to, to put out any kind of brag or anything. I, 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 got a, I did a deal this week with a guy from South Louisiana. I bought a boat from him. I made the deal. We agreed on the price, and I was going to buy the boat from this guy. We were going to go Saturday. 
and get this boat, me and Jacob. This boy texts me during the men's conference Friday night. Somebody had offered him $500 more than we agreed on. He sold it to them, hopes I understand. I did not understand. And I told him, I said, now I'm going to tell you, this is a raw deal. And what you did is not right. And if you can live with it, I can live with it. But I'm telling you right, what you should have done if you had to have that money is call me and offer me the same deal because we're the ones that made the deal. And you didn't do that and you're wrong for what you did. I said, my little boy's got his life jacket on. <laughs> He's ready to come get He was so excited about coming to get the boat. So I hung up the phone and Jake and told me he hated that guy and he's going to hit him with a fishing rod. And uh, so then I had to rein in all of my flesh and have a teachable moment. And I told him, son, we don't hate anybody. And we're just going to believe the Lord that he saved us from getting a bad boat. Apart from something happening on the trip that we didn't want to happen on that trip, we're going to pray whoever got it got a good boat, and we're going to pray that that guy won't lie to nobody else and hurt nobody else. And we prayed together for that guy, and then he said, well, I still don't like him. I said, well, I don't like him either, <laughs> son. I don't. See, a picture of Jesus is not about how we respond when people love us. If you really want to find out what Jesus was like, you read and you'll find he tells us to be a blessing to people that curse us, to love people that hate us, that despitefully use us. I'm thankful that I didn't, that, that little lesson didn't cost me any money. Amen? <laughs> That's a whole other situation I would have had to try to rein in to have a teachable moment. Thankfully, I got to keep my money over that deal. And, uh, you know, I can still catch my breath and float around pretty good anyway. So it, we're all good. But the fact of the matter is, is we have a responsibility as Christian people not to be like the world. Because I would love to go into great detail about everything my mind immediately said I should go do. But I had, I had, I had to have a funeral. <laughs> I had to take all that and, and kill it. And it's kind of like that snake we talk about all the time around here. When you've got a snake in your house, you don't pet it or play with it. When, that's, when that boils up in your flesh, you better deal with it. You better have a funeral. And you better nail it shut and bury it deep. Amen? And be done with it. Because if you don't, that bitterness will come out of you. You'll ruin your testimony. That bitterness will come out and you'll hurt somebody. I, I told him, I said, who knows? We might end up down there preaching a revival and meet that old boy someday. And if we do, I hope we can win him to the Lord. Amen? There's no way he's saved and lying like that. <laughs> Amen. So maybe we can reach the old boy. Maybe somebody can help him. But all the same, we remember then that we've got to remember who we are. And we've got to understand that there has been a death in our life. And that death is a death to sin. That sin no longer reigns in our body. And so what we understand then as a Christian is if sin comes in, it's because we let it. And people blame the devil for stuff all the time. And they say, the devil made me do it and the devil's on me today. Listen, if you snoozed five times and you were late for work, it wasn't the devil's fault. Amen? If you like Brother Paul Carter and put 90,000 miles on a set of tires and the wires are sparking while you're going down the road... And you have a flat tire somewhere, that's not the devil's fault. <laughs> Amen. If you try to drive from here to Balkanville with the low fuel light on and you run out of gas, don't blame it on the devil. And why in the world are you going to Balkanville? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I had to go through there five times this week going to that revival. Well, there's all kinds of things that we try to blame the devil for. Well, the fact of the matter is, it's because we're lost. We're, without God, we're just lost sinners. But because of God and because of what he brings into our life as saved people tonight and as Christian people tonight, all that stuff is lost. And now nothing can have victory over me. Now if I get up and got a flat tire, call your boss, tell him you got a flat tire and thank God that you didn't have four flat tires. Amen? you got to find the good in stuff and you have the privilege now to see the Lord in everything you do because you're a Christian. Why? Because you're dead to sin and sin is dead to you. Sin does not have dominion in your life. Sin does not have reign over you. Sin does not have permission to come into your life unless you grant it. You have got victory over sin, and you need to wake up every day and claim that victory. You need to get up every morning and have a funeral. If Paul said, I die every day, then old Rube needs to die too. If one of the greatest preachers that wrote the majority of the New Testament or books in the Bible than anybody, if he said he had to die every single day, then who am I to think that I can dabble with my sin and overcome my flesh and do any good without dying to myself every day as well? So we need to acknowledge our passing. We need to acknowledge our position in Christ. And that is that our identity is in Jesus tonight. That we now belong to him. We are representatives of him. We are, the Bible calls us joint heirs. We are the heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus. That we have become a part of his inheritance. He has brought us into the family. If you remember, I know you do because it's so powerful. 
It was five years ago on a Wednesday night Bible study. I know you hadn't forgot this. We did a study on the Lord's Prayer. And I got hung up, because I will get hung up every now and then on a word or a phrase, when Jesus said, Our Father. And it took me three weeks to get over it. We did three Wednesday nights on those two words, Our Father. Because I could not get over the fact that Jesus brought us in to his relationship with God with that one word. He didn't say pray to your father. He didn't say pray to my father. He said you pray to our father. And he likens us to his relationship with God in prayer, which is the most powerful tool we have in the church tonight. And so then if he says I have the same relation with God in prayer that he does, then there ought to be some similar power in my life and in my church. And the only reason there's not is because we hadn't had enough funerals. We hadn't died. We had to live like we're dead. Amen? Don't live like you're dying. Live like you're dead. Live like you're dead. Die. Dead to sin. Dead to the flesh. Dead to the things of this world. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 3, Paul writing to the church there says, For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. The only access we have to God is through Jesus Christ. And the only way we can be a child of God is by Jesus Christ. And so when I surrendered my life to Christ, I died, and he reigns in my life. And Paul says in our text, in verse 3, he asks them this question. When he asks them, do you not understand? that you're dead to sin. And if you're dead to sin, why are you still walking in sin? Why are you still making an excuse for sin? Why do you want to sin because you know that there's grace? You're dead to sin. We used the illustration this morning, made it to Facebook, that Dale Earnhardt didn't drive a race car ever after he died. He was no longer a race car driver. When we die to our sin, listen, we're no longer sinners. Sin no longer has dominion and control over us. We're free in Jesus Christ. Doesn't mean we don't mess up. Doesn't mean we don't slip up. Doesn't mean we won't sin, but we're no longer characterized by sin. We're no longer a slave to sin. Thank God for that. And so he poses this question. Know you not that so many of us... I read this this afternoon and realized this is probably why God put this off to tonight. Because it had so much to do with baptism. And we're baptizing tonight. He said in verse 3, Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? What he's saying is, is the part of us when we came to Jesus and we were submerged and immersed in the Holy Ghost of God. See, you can't teach sprinkle baptism right here. This is about coming in and getting completely washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus by being submerged in the Holy Ghost of God. And he said, when you did that, baptism is a picture of burial. Do you ever heard the expression a dead ringer? You know where that came from? Years ago, Ripley's Believe It or Not taught me this. I went to the school of Ripley's Believe It or Not. They would, they, they'd, people be in a coma and they would bury them and they wouldn't know it. They'd dig them up later for some kind of study and see that they'd come back to life and was scratching trying to get out of their coffin. And so they put a string and a bell up to the top and people sat in the cemetery at night and they'd bury those people and if they come back awake in there, they'd ring that bell. They called them dead ringers. True story. That was a dead ringer. Amen. Let it marinate. You need that. We come to learn tonight. We come to get educated. So when he makes this statement that who was baptized in Christ, he's talking about being buried in Christ. That we were buried in Christ, and if we were buried in Christ, we were a part of his death. And that means when Jesus died, he took our death with him. He died our death, listen to me, so we could live his life. So he took all of our death, all of our sin, all of our punishment. He goes to the cross of Calvary. He dies in our place. He takes our death, our eternal separation from God. He gets the wrath of God. He absorbs it. He takes it. He takes all that we could not take and gives us all that he had. And Paul says to this church, don't you continue in sin or continue as a sinner because you, when you were baptized in Jesus, you were dead. You were buried in Christ. And that's why when we have baptism tonight, we'll be celebrating the fact, not that the people that come through this water tonight are being saved, but that they've already been saved and their life is hid with God in Christ. That they've been baptized. First of all, they've been spiritually baptized in the Holy Ghost, in the blood of the Lord Jesus, and they've been saved. This is just a picture. We go into the water to picture that this person was alive before God saved them in sin. 
They died to their sin and they were buried and they were risen, resurrected to walk in the newness of life. Paul's saying to us here, acknowledge who we are. Acknowledge the passing of the old man, of the sinner that's in all of us. He's saying acknowledge the position that we have and that is the position that we are now in Christ. I'm glad that we're in church tonight. But being in church is not going to set you free from your sin. I'm glad we're in church tonight. But being in church tonight is not going to save you. The only thing that's going to save you tonight is not being in church, but being in Christ. And Paul says, we are in Christ. We've been submerged in Christ. So we acknowledge that position. Ephesians 2, verse 4 through 6. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us. Death and life. He were dead in sin, then he's quickened us, brought us to life, and brought us together, he says, in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It's a good thing to be in a church. When we're baptized, we identify with the church. That is a public profession that we've become to, uh, we have become a Christian and now we're going to join with this church and do the work that God has called us to do. Baptism is a wonderful thing. Baptism is nothing without salvation. Church membership is nothing without salvation. It's a great thing to be in a church. not going to help you if you're not in Christ. But when we're in Christ, we should be in a church. We should be baptized. We should get in the work of the Lord and do what God has called us to do. Number, uh, number three, lastly, and we're out. Acknowledge our passing, acknowledge our position, and acknowledge our potential. He goes on from there in verse three. He gets in verse four and he says, Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. That our walk should show who we are in Jesus. The actions of our life, the things that we do, should represent Jesus. That means to us that we've got a new nature. There's a new nature that comes into the life of a believer. Somebody that used to would have drove to South Louisiana and strangled somebody. Now pulls over on the side of the road and prays for them. Amen. And then goes and eats ice cream to celebrate how good God is, right? We've got a new nature. That new nature has come in because that old man, that mean person, that sin that still bubbles up in the saved person's flesh, I can still nail it to the cross. I can still identify my sin in the death of Christ and then identify my life in his life so that I can do the things God wants me to do. I know none of y'all have ever had days like this, but I've had a day or two in my life since I've been saved that I blew it. I'm talking about I've done some stupid stuff. I've, I, you know, they use the expression with alcoholics that they fell off the wagon <laughs> and went back to drinking. Well, I never drank, but I fell off the wagon a time or two and, and, and done myself some sinning. Said some things I shouldn't have said. Thought some things I shouldn't have thought. And I'm telling you, it ain't good. But it's a beautiful day in the child of God and in his life when he realizes that on my worst day as a Christian, I'm still a Christian. On my worst day, the day that I have blown it the most, I still have not only the liberty and freedom to do it, but I have the authority by God's word to take that sin that I just sinned to the cross of Calvary, nail it up, and walk away clean. I'm finna get happy in here tonight. That I get to walk away in the life of Christ because all of my sin, even what I hadn't done yet, that I ought to strive not to do, but even what I hadn't done yet is still nailed to his cross. And all I got to do is clean myself. Listen, I, I, like to, I like to say, and a guy said one time, that uh, you can take a good bath, and you can get real clean. In a couple days, you're going to need another one. Confession's good for the soul. And so there are times we need to just come to grips with the fact that we're not perfect, and we're sinners, but we're Christians. And so we take it to the cross, and we give it back to Jesus, and we identify in his death those things that reek of death, and we give them to God and we walk away fresh and clean and new. We have a new nature because we're a new creature. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17 says, if any man is born again, that if anybody is born in Christ, he's a new creature. That old things pass away, everything becomes new. That if we've, if we've become a child of God, all of those things that we are in Christ is because of the new birth. Everything that we were without Christ is now identified with his death. 
I have a new nature because I'm a new creature. I have a new nature because I'm a new creature, and I'm a new creature because he made me a new man. He made us something new. He made us something that we weren't when we came to Christ and got saved. Again, in Colossians, I didn't realize how many times I would go back to Colossians referencing things since we've done that study. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 9 through verse 11, Paul says this, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That you might walk, listen, walk worthy, he says, of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened, he says in verse 11, with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. We have to acknowledge our potential. When you go, since we talked about race cars a little bit this morning, you don't go to, you don't take a race car to a track, put 87 octane, 10% ethanol gas in it. But that's what we do as Christians. We go out of here, we'll never reach our full potential with dirty gas. Amen? We'll never reach our, when you, when you dilute the product, <laughs> then you're diluting your performance. And so when we take away from ourselves, the richness and the fullness and the depth of the joy of the Word of God. And we don't experience everything therein that God would have us to have. Then we walk out of here crippled from the start. We walk out of here in a mess. We walk out of here limping. When we ought to walk out, I, I, I saw a thing, that for, for those of you that don't know much about much, this is called a meme. <laughs> Anybody? For years I called them memes because I didn't know the difference. It was a picture of a line of kittens. <laughs> and it said, walking into the prayer closet. And the next picture was a line of lions. And it said, coming out. When we come to Sunday, there's no, listen, it's no surprise if we limp in here. It's our fault if we limp out. Because we're a new creature. And we come to do business with God. Take all of that w stuff from the week. Lay it on the altar and give it to Him. Take all of that freshness, that newness, that real, genuine thing of God and go out of here ready to fight hell with a water pistol if we have to, to fight through another week as a child of God. And next Sunday, we come limping back into worship to get fresh and clean in the presence of God to go out and do the work God called us to do. What should we do then? We should live like we're dead. I remember, I've talked about the Green Mile. Y'all remember that Green Mile movie, Big John Coffee? I almost got beat up by a guy that looked like him in Baton Rouge. That's another story for another day. <laughs> but I didn't, thank God. But I thought he was going to kill me. Anyway, on the Green Mile, they had that guy that walked. He'd say, dead man walking. They'd do a trial, like a, a, a pre-run for people going to the electric chair, and he'd walk around, dead man walking, dead man walking. They'd say, shut up. Will you shut up? Dead man walking. But that really should be our mantra. Because you know what? Dead men don't sin. Dead men are not scared. Dead men don't tremble. 15-year-old David picked up five rocks, the number of God's grace. And he walked through a valley and he devoured a giant. Because dead men don't have limitations. Dead men are not scared of giants. Because what can a giant do to a dead man? Kill him? When David lost his, 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 his child to Bathsheba, he came out, cleaned himself up. He broke his fast. He got ready to go on about his life. And they said, King David, what's wrong with you? How are you so up and fresh? Why are you not mourning anymore? And he said, because he can't come back to me. But I'm going to go to him. You can't, you can't stop somebody who knows their eternity is settled. You can't stop me with anything when I'm already dead. <laughs> dead man walking. Don't go skydiving. That's ridiculous. Or you will be dead. Just live like you're dead. Bury yourself in Christ. Walk in the newness of life. Acknowledge tonight your potential. And the Lord's got something he can use us to do. But not till we get out of the way. But when we get out of the way and people see Jesus, we can change the world. Y'all stand with me. Father, we love you tonight. Thank you for a good day. Thank you, Lord, for this message and how you've used it today to just speak to our hearts what we needed to hear. Now as we come to this invitation, I pray 
Father, if there's one in here tonight that needs to be saved, that they'd come and surrender their life to Christ. If there are others in here tonight who know as Christians they've allowed sin to bubble back up in their lives and rob them of the potential they have to walk for Christ and walk in Christ that the world may see Jesus, I pray we'd have an old-fashioned call to repentance where the Lord's people come and get our hearts right and go out of here fresh and go out of here clean to do the work of the Lord that you've called us to do. Forgive us where we failed you. Let the Spirit of God be that restrainer in our lives, in our minds, in our hearts, in our mouths that keep us from saying or doing anything that's unbecoming of a Christian. At the end of the day, all that matters is that people see you in us. Help us to be faithful to that call. Bless our invitation. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.